Today's episode of The Anthony Anderson Show is brought to you by mtgox.com. That's M-T-G-O-X.com. And BitPay. That's bit-pay.com. And mezzygrill.com. That's M-E-Z-E grill.com. And carpevm.com. C-A-R-P-E-V-M.com. Greetings, everyone. This is Anthony Anderson coming at you live from New York City. Uh, we have a very special guest today who's not only a hero of mine, but also a friend. His name is Frank Giglio, otherwise known as Chef Frankie G. Let me say a little bit about him first. Frank is a classically trained chef from the New England Culinary Institute in Montpelier, Vermont. He has been fully immersed in the culinary world for the last 16 years, which through all of his experiences allowed him to create a very, very nourishing and sustainable cuisine today. Frank's creations are emerging of traditional food preparation, raw, new, raw food nutrition, and folklore herbal medicine. His farm-to-table style cuisine is simple, nutritious, and enables the freshness of the ingredients to speak for themselves. Frank is the owner of Frank's Finest LLC, which features organic herb and spice blends. Greetings, Frank. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Good to be here. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No problem. Very cool, very cool. So um, as we get started, if you want to introduce yourself, I mean, I said a little bit about you, but if you want to kind of give the guests a little background on how you got into the, um, into the world of cooking and becoming a chef and raw food and whole food. Sure. Yeah, cool, there we go. So to be up to date, I currently live in Maine, in southern Maine with my wife. And as of today, we have a, a four four month old boy named Wilder. Congratulations. So, um, thank you. A lot of this story kind of leads up to where I am today and having a son. So um, to go back, I grew up in Connecticut, spent most of my, my life there. Um, kind of been not so much interested in food, but when it was when I was 15 and it was time for me to get a job, for whatever reason, I decided to go into a restaurant and just took a really low paying job and, and was a dishwasher at a local little um, elderly home huh. and you know the job wasn't great but what I noticed immediately was I had this attraction to um, the way the food was being prepared the energy of the chef and he was really like kind of loud and obnoxious and and for whatever reason I just really in, got very inspired and as I was watching him put out meals all in this like timely manner and having a good time, I sort of wanted to learn more. And so I slowly um, started asking more questions, getting more involved with the food. And then after about a year working at that place, I knew it was something I really wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. So I went to a, a kind of your traditional New England um, seafood restaurant. Okay. Where, you know, on a Saturday in the summer, you do, you serve a thousand people and there's, you know, two to three hour waits and um, crazy job. The food was you know, pretty poor. It was mostly fried food, but um, again, I learned so much and, and basically worked my way up from kind of the salad prep guy all the way to working the line and working almost full time while I was in high school. And yes. and I knew from there that when I was going to graduate high school, culinary school was probably um, my most skilled area of life and something I wanted to pursue as a as a trade. Cool. And so you went into culinary right out of high school, or did you take some time off? Nope, I went directly after high school. Um, that was in 1997 when I graduated high school. So in the fall of 97, that's when I headed up to Vermont and uh, did the, the culinary school up there. And how long is their program? Um, it's a two-year program for the associate's degree. Um, but the way the school works is, is you get put into a block with seven other, other students for six months. So from basically September through um, March, I was with these same seven students, and we did various classes, um, you know, as level one um, intro to culinary school. Okay. At the end of the six months, we're allowed to choose any restaurant in the United States we want to work at and do an apprenticeship, and of course, that's as long as we qualify and get the job and can get our own room and board um, uh -huh. up there. So. Um, from there, I chose to go to Portland, Oregon. Cool. And do an apprenticeship there at the Heathman Hotel. And then you go back to the school and you kind of repeat that cycle, um, advancing in the, in the classes you take. And then your second apprenticeship, they kind of opened you up to, to going anywhere in the world to work in a restaurant as long as you, um, again, can get a job and get hired. 
So, so your early experience was in Vermont and Oregon, so were you exposed to a lot more farm-to-table stuff early on, or did that come later? No, it was actually, like, in all these different experiences I had through the years, I was still, like, I grew up kind of the, the standard American diet. Before going to culinary school, I ate a very little vegetables, you know, I, I was very, I ate probably the same 10 meals, you know, yeah. for the last probably... 10 years so yeah. um, I wasn't very open to many things but as soon as I went to culinary school all these different choices came started coming to me and and obviously you want to taste stuff and learn and develop your palate so I began opening up my um, my diet just because of what we were serving but sure yeah, in Vermont in winter you're eating a lot of like tons of root vegetables um, bitter greens not so much like romaine and iceberg you're eating like Frise and radicchio and mustard greens, real hearty kind of stuff. And then, and then once I went to Oregon in the spring, that was I worked at a, a super high end restaurant where there was no food costs and there was no budget in the kitchen. Um, you know, fresh caught wild salmon were delivered first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. When it was berry season, you would get, fl you know, huge flats with maybe six different varieties of fresh local berries. Yeah. the local Bing cherries um, or the Rainier cherries, really eating what was um, growing or being raised um, or caught wild in the in that local environment, basically the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Oh, very so cool. So you guys learned so much. Major, you know, um, at the time I didn't think about it so much, but like looking back at some of those experiences, I was like, wow, I was really had it um, pretty good as far as the whole farm farm to table idea in local local cuisine yeah and that was a while ago too i mean i think that's you know it's very popular now but even looking back maybe five years ago it was still uh, at least in the mainstream kind of coming up so being exposed yep. in the you know late 90s is awesome yeah it, it was great and, and i was i was so young at the time you know going to portland i think i was just turning 20 it was really the first time i ever left new england with the mm -hmm. exception of going to like disney world so yeah um i didn't i bet i didn't fully experience what i could experience now but um you know it definitely definitely planted some seeds so it was pretty pretty powerful experience looking back at it and so being immersed in that world did uh, you, you, the way i came across your work was through the raw vegan world Mm -hmm. And so, were you ever a hundred percent into that, or were you, you know, just getting people to eat like real foods, whole food? What was the path with all of that stuff? Well, right after I completely finished school and finished my apprenticeship, I kind of bounced around the states quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, went back to Connecticut. I then took a job in color, or actually took a job in Alaska. Cool. And worked a seasonal job there. Back to Connecticut. Then out to Colorado again back to Connecticut um, and then and always working in restaurants okay kind of really doing your kind of straightforward line cook position sure it wasn't until I moved back to Connecticut that personally I just felt like um, I wasn't living life up to its greatest potential working in a restaurant you know the nightlife kind of took its toll on me and and I was offered a job working at a local health food store in Connecticut hmm. and, and there was a place I shopped at every once in a while but I basically was asked if I wanted to run this little deli and it was all vegetarian and it was all mostly takeout kind of like a westerlies um, in that back kitchen where they have kind of like oh, takeout yeah. stuff oh yeah and I basically had to self teach myself or train myself how to do vegetarian cuisine uh -huh. um, in a you know, kind of a natural food store way like I could obviously cook vegetables and stuff like that but you know, incorporating different types of grains and different kind of ethnic cuisines. Really didn't know that all that well. So I basically worked at this job for about four years and really started switching to more of a um, vegetarian-based cuisine that I was cooking. Um, and But for myself, I wasn't really living what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was kind of still hanging out and having too much fun and yeah, and hang out with my buddies and the late night scene and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I was introduced to raw foods that it really kind of turned my world upside down. And that was in 2006. Um, and I, it was funny because I just almost converted the, the little kitchen that I was working at into a raw food place. Yeah. 
as I was making the changes and feeling really good, I started kind of making the customers make the changes with me. Yeah, uh, oh, that's great. And as I uh, lost a lot of weight, had tons more energy, and was feeling really good, and it was time, you know, sharing that with everybody. So it was kind of caught on, and, and that was like a little fad in the store was raw foods. Um, wanting to pursue that more, I ended up going to the Tree of Life Center in uh -huh. Arizona and did their live food apprenticeship and then stayed on for about six months as an instructor. Okay. Uh, and so... Oh, I didn't know that. That training really allowed me to just fully understand raw foods and how to prepare all the different types of meals mm -hmm. and all the different, you know, mock dishes, kind of, you know. So really learned a lot there. And then that's when I kind of really started getting into sports. And it was time for me to kind of find a new path. It was like, all right, I got this food thing dialed in. Um, I know this was, you know, it was one of those, this is the way I'm going to live forever kind of thing. Sure. Now it's time to pers pursue um, long distance running. Okay. Or in sports. So um, I ended up packing up my bags, leaving Arizona, and headed back to Connecticut so that I could train for the, the Vermont 100. And you were primarily a raw vegan at this point? Yeah, that was like full on, 100% raw foods, like very, um, very dogmatic, I guess, about my yeah. approach and really started focusing on the, the high fruit diet and okay, uh, yep. grew a garden that w and had my own garden and worked at an organic um, um, vegetable garden as well, but primarily was fueled on imported fruit and that was really... Um, at the time, great for me. It helped me achieve my goals for running. Um, Health-wise, I don't think it, it did the best thing for me, but mm -hmm. um, really it just dialed in my, my sports regimen and allowed me to get as lean as I possibly could and as fast as I was able to get and um, be able to run for over 20 hours. That was kind of my goal. Wow, wow. So, was there um, was it was it conflicting? You know, coming from the culinary world where you're using really good quality animal products. Like for me, I, it was always just the junky, the junky animal products growing yeah. up. So I, I got exposed to the factory farm stuff, and then I just became a vegan. Yeah. But because I was never exposed to like good salmon and grass fed. So coming from your world, was it was it strange to cut that all out for a while? I think where I was at and and. The weight I was at and my overall health, I think I had to actually make that change mm -hmm. um, and really eliminate a lot of foods from my diet to actually just kind of create a whole new body and a whole new person and, and just detoxify and, and, or not so much detoxify, but get my body, get rid of, of the McDonald's that I ate day after day and the yeah. subs and the bologna and okay. the Fruit Loops and all that kind of thing. Sure. I think. It was absolutely important. You know, how long does one need to, like, do a cleanse for? You know, would six months been enough? Would a year been enough? I think I really got out of the nearly four years. I got a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing is even as I was very strict, raw foodist, a vegan, um, I still, for me, I've worked with animal foods for so long with, with meats and butchering and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, some people don't eat meat, but it really grosses them out. It's yeah. like, don't even, I don't want it on my cutting board. I don't want yes. it in my refrigerator. For me, it never bothered me because I'd handled it so much. So even as a 100% raw foodist and vegan, I would still help my friend butcher deer. Okay. He was, the, he was a longtime hunter, and yeah. I had the skills to butcher it. And so, you know, I wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't take a bite, but I would go down there and, and chop it all up without even flinching. It was like... I actually, one of my favorite things to do in, in cuisine and food and is, is actually butchering. It's, I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it was kind of interesting, even though I felt the need to shut, take that out of my diet, but it never really was something that I was um, grossed out or skeeved out about. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty, um, pretty common where people just are totally turned off by it and they don't yeah. even want it in their kitchen or in their house or <clears throat> nothing like that. Um, so besides the food, you, you're really like well known for like your herbalism and making all that kind of stuff, the wild harvesting. When did all those things start coming in? 
that really happened probably over the last you know three years or so. Mm -hmm. um, pretty recently with the with the herbs and the wild foods, you know, um, was fortunate to share a home with Daniel Vitalis, our, our good buddy, and and we now um, still live very close to each other. Actually, over his house today, but um, watching some of his videos and of course the work of, of David Wolf, just those two and a few other people out there, close friends, just really opened my world opened up my eyes to a whole new world. Sure. It was like, all of a sudden, you know, as I was very in interested in running, my whole goal was to get from point A to point, I love trail running, not so much road running. And um, I'd spend all this time in nature, but all I wanted to do was get to the top of the mountain as fast as I possibly could, and then I'd turn around and try to get to the bottom as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. And I got pretty good at it. And, you know, you get a little view from the top, and of course you get to, you know, you get to see these amazing different trail systems, but I never really actually stopped to see what was really surrounding me. And um, they kind of opened my eyes to just like stop, kind of look and listen and, and see, you know, maybe you only walk a quarter of a mile and it takes you a couple hours to walk that quarter of a mile. But here I find this mushroom that'll help my immune system. I might find some wild berries. Yeah. There might be fiddlehead ferns. Like there's all this potential food that I could take in and nourish myself and, and nourish my family with and incorporate it into the, the cuisine that I already know. And I was like, whoa, this is so powerful. It's like, yeah, running, you know, for me personally, running made me feel great. I, you know, accomplished great goals and achieved all the things I wanted to achieve with running, but it became time to actually like kind of ground down a little bit. It was mm -hmm. like high fruit, run really fast, always on the go. Um, I was like kind of just floating around. It was yes. always on the move. It was like I need to like go and traveling a lot and not really wanting to stay in one place. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I think I've I think I've come to this point in my life where it's time to actually ground down yeah. um, and just like get more connected with your environment. Um, and that that was a huge game changer. That kind of shifted my entire world and helped me to come to where I am right now. What did you, did you notice like big physical changes going back to animal products? Um, I noticed more changes. I don't think um, I noticed major physical changes with the animal foods. Obviously, from going from running um, up to 100 miles a week and averaging probably 40 to 50 miles a week, you're basically burning lots and lots of calories. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was... I could eat whatever I want, whenever I wanted, and I didn't gain any weight. I actually had trouble keeping weight on. Um, so I think any shift where you don't exercise as much as I was and you don't eat, I was very kind of scared of fats. I was like, I don't want to eat any fats. I could only eat, you know, fruits and vegetables. I got to really avoid all the fats and the nuts and the seeds. So I was really kind of fanatical about it. And then once I started allowing myself to eat a, a variety of foods, including animal foods and animal fats, I naturally did gain some weight back. Mm -hmm. um, and now I feel, you know, I'm probably 15 pounds heavier than I was when I was really in my top running shape. But I feel, I feel strong. I feel robust. I feel like I could, you know, accomplish all the physical feats I need to. You know, I don't have, I don't have that speed that I, I once had because I'm not training like I used to. But I feel I can go out there and put miles on if I have to, and I don't have to um, kind of eat this really narrow diet to allow myself to do that. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that living up in Maine is supports that lifestyle, or does it make it harder? The current lifestyle. The current lifestyle. Yeah, I think um, I think I'm I'm right in with the. I think I'm not that I don't want to say I have to eat this way, but I feel the diet I'm eating closely resembles what is growing abundantly in Maine or being raised in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I feel really close to um, kind of almost symbiosis with, with, my, with the state of Maine that I live in, with my diet. And you're harvesting spring water as well? Yeah, I actually need to go tonight, but um, we have probably about 20 minutes away. There's a, a local spring called Bond Mountain, and um, that sucker just pumps serious amounts of water. I mean, you could fill a five-gallon jug in about 
30 seconds wow. when, it's really, when it's really on full bore. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, even adding that, like a simple lifestyle change for me of, you know, and that was something Camille and I decided, okay, we want to live in a place where we could drink fresh water and have it close to us. And Maine was a, a good place for us. Camille was raised in Maine. But um, just making that addition of spring water into my diet um, as you know, I won't say it's the only water I ever drink, but primarily mm-hmm. it's usually always spring water. And, you know, flushing out that old bottled water and city tap water, it's a, it's, it was a, a huge, huge benefit to my health just doing that. And the experience of going to a spring and collecting my water, it's, um, I love, I've been on this kick of, of do it yourself. Anything you could do yourself as opposed to having to go buy, I'm kind of in support of it. Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of been practicing practicing that a lot of what can I do myself instead of buying it pre-packaged or hiring somebody to do or you know having to buy it yeah it's been really fun so spring water is kind of one of those it's it's probably up the number one thing yeah maybe growing my own food yeah spring water is so huge people don't even give it any credit they have no idea like the water game but um, so have you been doing any fishing or hunting um, I did a bit, of, a bit of fishing this summer. I used to be in high school. I was kind of a diehard um, fisherman. Yeah, my dad, me too. My dad's retired. He has his bass boat, and he, <laughs> him and his, his good buddy, fish a couple times a week. And I grew up on that. And um, you know, as I switched my diet, I let it all go. I actually sold all my hunting gear, sold all my fishing gear, and it was just kind of said, "I'll never do this again." Yeah. And, um, and I loved it as a child, and I loved it as a teenager, and it was just one of those things that's like, all right, I don't do that anymore, time to find something else. And um, over the last, like, two years or so, I kind of regretted selling all that stuff mm-hmm. and not, like, buying it all back again. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I enjoy fishing. I do, I do some hunting. Um, I won't say I'm the most successful hunter, but um, I don't put in the time that it takes to actually um, harvest your own game, but... Some small game in the past I've I've uh, I've harvested and um, some pigeons here and there so okay all, all food of course and th- these wouldn't be New York City pigeons no no not <laughs> no not at all <laughs> um, on that line I was curious like what kind of wild game do you see up there well like what kind of things are people eating are they doing a, a lot of organ meats or are, I mean are people giving those away what's what's that like usually well I'd say being in Maine and, and New England in general well northern New England moose is is the biggest game um, animal out here and I've seen them a couple times while I've lived in Maine very hard you know you don't see them that often mm-hmm. if you go up north you'd probably see them you know a little more likely yeah uh, there's black bear which the whole practice of hunting black bear is kind of um, usually they're faded donuts. Which yeah. Is quite disturbing. So that's not something I have. They're like a big raccoon. They're not something um, I'd actually want to hunt. But mm-hmm. they're here, and obviously the deer, um, quite differently than, you know, say Maryland all the way up the coast to Connecticut, where deer are um, so overpopulated and um, you could see them just like you see a squirrel. They're very common up here in Maine because. Maine's about 90% uninhabited, mm-hmm. so it's a lot of forest and open space for animals to roam, so you're not as likely to see them, even though there's less cities and towns or um, sprawled living spaces, um, you don't see the deer as often. You know, I've been in this home about a year and a half, and I live on 50 acres. There's a couple hundred across the street from me, and I've only seen de- a deer in this property maybe twice. Wow. Um, Lots of wild turkeys, and definitely I'd say that the real kind of long-term hunters, the, the liver of the deer or the moose is probably their, their number one food. Mm-hmm. And, um, if I ask any old-time hunter, they'll probably say liver and onions, their, their favorite, uh, favorite way to prepare um, yeah. any wild game. Yeah, it's funny in Minnesota, um, people do it all the time and it's a lot of, I mean there's a lot of, a lot of fields unfortunately like where I'm at, most of the forests are further north where you, we see moose and black bear up there, but people will just give away the organs, like they wouldn't even yeah. think to eat the liver or the heart or the kidneys, mm-hmm. so you can just get all that stuff for free just by letting people know that you want oh, it. Yeah. 
and yeah. then yeah and even like the fat people just want like the muscle tissue and then that's pretty much it so it's pretty good once you're tapped into that stuff oh yeah absolutely i mean there's um Opening up to liver has been something, you know, such like real dense nutrition. Mm -hmm. There's so much there. The average person's like, I want that tenderloin. I want that, you know, ribeye steak. They want those real fancy cuts of meat that cost, you know, 20 bucks a pound where the real nutrition is like $1.99 a pound. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, op I've been opening up to, you know, a lot of different organ meats and I must say, like, heart is one of my favorites. The The flavor is really amazing. You can kind of put it into dishes, and you don't actually know. Like, liver is pretty intense flavor, uh -huh. you know. So when somebody's, you know, oh, I'm open to trying some new foods, or I'll, I'll try some organ meats. Sometimes you give somebody the liver, and they're just like, whoa, that's just way too intense, too much flavor. Yeah. I can't take it, but the heart, you can just kind of sneak it right in there, and no one's even going to know what it is. They're just going to think it's some ground meat. How do you prepare it? Um, I put it in, just kind of chop it up and put it into like chili or stew. Okay. Or like quick little stir fries. Or, you know, even if I know, if I know exactly where it came from, you know, a buddy gave it to me and it's pretty fresh, I'll slice it very thin and um, do a kind of carpaccio style, just a little bit of seasoning. Wow. There's a little olive oil, maybe a splash of lemon, and just enjoy it like that. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and you could also, I've been getting into a lot more curing and, and, and oh, preserving sure. meats. Heart's one of those that you could actually cure and then smoke and then keep that for long-term storage. Okay, okay. Yeah. Have you had any experience like making the, like prosciutto with like, you know, you salt down the leg or something and then you hang it? I've been seeing some of that, but I haven't had the chance yet. Yeah, prosciutto, that's kind of one of my goals when, I, when I'm able to actually raise a pig myself. I'm kind of, we're looking into hopefully buying land sometime, and that's when I really want to get into raising goats, raising pigs, raising more chickens. Um, so when I, you know, if I'm able to butcher my own pig, I'd have four legs that I could potentially yep. cure. Yep. Um, so right now I haven't wanted to, like, buy that part to kind of to make that. But um, back in the day, we've done kind of Italian salami sausage is called, uh, we call it cabagool. Okay. A, kind of a free, um, almost like salami. Uh-huh. That one we've done in restaurants where it's pretty easy. You just make a, a basic brine, almost like you'd make a, a pickle brine, and you, you put the uh, tenderloins in there, and you let them sit for a couple days, and then you take them out, and you put them in a salt cure. Wow. And then after that salt cure, they call it, the Italians will call it uh, cellar meat. Okay. They would take and they'd hang it down in their cellar, and they let it cure for you know a couple months or so. Mhm. Mm mhm. Yep. And you just slice it up, you know, wipe off the sides, slice it up, and enjoy it on a little piece of cucumber or something. Yeah. Are you you're familiar with River Cottage? Oh yeah, I, I actually you gave it to Allie, I gave it, she gave it to me, and I watched every episode. There's they did a special called Pig in a Day. And yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, and they like actually have it as a seminar and people come in and it's it's quite expensive, but you can have the, the DVD and they really just went into all the details. And then I actually heard of somebody that would plant t potatoes all around their, um, their pig area. And then mm -hmm. whenever they were ready, they would let the pigs just dig them up and eat them all. Oh, wow. And That's that way they didn't even have to like worry about it, you know, and stuff like that. And pigs That's can handle cool. it, I guess. Um, yeah, no, that's really cool. That's really cool. So how did you get into making your own spices? Um, a few years ago, it was about, well, I was working in New Hampshire at a little, a, another um, health food store, and I had a guy come in who was opening up a coffee shop, and he wanted to make chai tea. And so he came in, we were just, you know, just chatting, and he said, do you have any good chai tea recipes? Because I want to make chai tea and serve it at my coffee shop. I was like, well, I don't, but, you know, I'll, I'll formulate you a, a recipe. And um, so I got in the kitchen, started kind of mixing. I went online, looked up your classic kind of chai spice recipes, mm -hmm. said, how could I make this my own? I wanted to eliminate the tea, so I didn't want any black tea in there. Uh -huh. I wanted the caffeine-free tea. And I wanted to add in um, kind of a medicinal element to the, the spices that are normally in there. So... 
I whipped up this recipe. It tasted really good. He was really into it. And then I was like, wow, this was this kind of cool. I could sell this. So I could just in the store, I started packaging it up. I did one in a powder version and also did one in a teacup version. Mm -hmm. Just started selling it. And then I just, you know, when we'd roast chickens or do some, some red meats, I always had a few ingredients that I kind of, it was like a, like a chili spice or barbecue spice. Yep. And so I actually started measuring out each ingredient and kind of tweaked it. And then I had my barbecue spice, which I ended up calling the uh, Smoky Southern Spice originally. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, I love that one. I still use it almost daily. Um, so I had that one, and then I whipped up a, a curry recipe. I actually had this curry recipe that I was using for years and kind of found that in some old notebook. And then, boom, I ordered a bunch of spices, blended them all up, and had my friend create a logo for me. And I was like, all right, I want to start selling these things. And it just kind of um, went from there. And they're still available online? People can get them? Yeah, the website or the company name is Frank's Finest. So it's, it's uh, franksfinestllc.com. Okay, franksfinestllc.com. So Very cool. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting as I look at them now, and, and now I'm up to about 10 different blends. I'm working on a few more for the upcoming Longevity Now conference. And mm -hmm. I see them as, for somebody who's new to cooking, or they didn't, they weren't brought up kind of making food from scratch, or they were on a, a more raw food-based diet, and now they want to start cooking some food, and they, they're just not that familiar with kind of mixing different spices. Um, all these blends that I sell, they're kind of like, mini ego boosters for the, the home cook. That's yeah. how I kind of look at them. It's like, you know, you're making something, you don't know how it's going to taste, you just take a scoop of the barbecue spice, stir it in there, and it's oh, like, wow, yeah. it tastes great. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of how I look at it. It's like, I just, my, my inspiration is to get people to start preparing food from scratch. And yeah. whether that's cooked or raw, whatever is best for you, but um, just getting people to create that relationship with their food again and start cooking and preparing food um, these spices kind of help people um, have that confidence that the food's going to taste good and they could, you know, create healthy meals. Yeah, yeah, well put, man. I like to, um, I think my favorite, my, I, well, I do a few things. Smoky Southern, for sure. And I'll do in a small pan, like maybe four eggs. And yeah. then I'll cover it so the, the tops will cook. That way I don't have to flip it. And yeah. then I'll lay on a little bit of grass-fed cheddar and then I'll just liberally sprinkle a lot of smoky southern on top. And then yeah. I just slide that onto the plate. And you can do a little pico de gallo on the side if you want to. But just by itself, it's so good. And it's like three things. That's it. And it's like the yep. best breakfast. And then I do a lot. I blend coconut milk with the chai. And I'll put yep. a little vanilla stevia in there or a little maple syrup. And that's just like that, that breakfast will take me for like six hours. Yeah. Just with the coconut milk, it's just so satisfying, yeah. and the chai and the coconut, it's just so good. And then I've been playing around with lemon pepper a lot lately too. Nice. With that salmon. One's a good one. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. For the summer, doing the you know any fish or even like sardines or something or yeah. vegetables, light steamed broccoli, a little lemon pepper on there. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Fact, I just created one. I call it the um, chili garlic spice. Oh, nice. And, um, I, I created it and then I tasted it and I was like, oh my God, this is like the MSG free ramen noodle pack. <laughs> yeah. If you spray in ramen noodles, like the chicken flavor, which I guarantee like every listener probably has at some point in their life. Oh yeah. That packet, when you smell mine, it instantly takes you back to like buying nine packages of ramen noodles for like 60 cents <laughs> and living off those for days. Yeah. My dad still eats them. <laughs> I, I got to get him some of that stuff now because, uh, yeah, he's got to get off that stuff. I mean, he's still eating ramen noodles. The guy's like 55. And ramen noodles and dinty more beef stew in a yeah. pot. And he just stirs it all up. And, yep. And, yeah, you know, well, well yeah, little baby steps, I guess. But, yeah, everyone, you can get that at franksfinestllc.com. They're really good. He makes them himself. Um, amazing. It'll really, like, yeah, like you said, it'll really boost your ego because you just – People just think you're like the best chef ever because you're like using these spices and it takes the guesswork out of it too. So I'm, a, I'm definitely a huge fan. So you mentioned Longevity Now Conference. When is that happening? That is coming up in about just about a month now, the last weekend of September. Okay. Um, that is in Costa Mesa, California. Okay. Really amazing event. This is my, I think, 
fourth time being at the event. Um, sometimes as a speaker, sometimes just working. This year, I'm I'm managing the Tonic Bar, which nice uh, is kind of Truth Hawkins' baby. Who he started the Tonic Bar at Air One. We kind of bring in that whole idea, um, different some different recipes, some of his kind of classic recipes, and we we make up uh, ice creams and um, savory soups and different hot herbal teas for the whole entire weekend. Uh, we serve thousands of drinks. Pretty pretty amazing how we could crank it all out um, with about six people blending drinks nonstop from 8 in the morning until 11 at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just amazing. What's the key to making a good ice cream? A good ice cream. Well, I could do it completely without... Well, the key. Hold on. I like... Something frozen, so either frozen berries. Right now, it's, I'm all about the, the frozen blueberry. Mm-hmm. So that's like really the base. Instead of, you have to like eliminate your typical ice cream recipe where it's either, you know, heavy cream with eggs or, you know, like the vegan version, they're like tons of cashews or macadamia nuts. Yeah. Coconut meat. Um, what I'm doing and what I've learned from Truth is you're either taking ice, which sometimes I'll make a herbal tea, like I'll do a, I'll make chaga tea, then create chaga ice cubes. Whoa. And so that's the base. Or we do the frozen blueberries, because that's my favorite. Currently, they're, you know, in Maine, everywhere. So frozen blueberries. Then you need to add a certain amount of kind of powders to flavor it. And, you know, you can make chocolate. You can make, I love just adding vanilla. Mesquite is probably my favorite condiment to blueberries. Cool. And then getting in a good amount of fat to kind of really cream it up and not make it so much of like a mashed up icicle. Yeah, yeah. So either we have a great dairy source here, so we get this a beautiful Jersey um, raw cream. Mm-hmm. So I'll do raw cream or yogurt works well. Or, you know, coconut milk it would work totally fine. But you need something really rich and fatty to kind of really make it a, a really creamy and nourishing. Yeah, yeah, to cream it up. I, I've seen some people like dumping in the tocotrienols. Is that, uh, would, would you recommend that as well? Yeah, tocotrienols, tocotrienols or even like lacuma. Oh, those okay. work great as a, um, as a vegetarian or vegan um, kind of creamer. Okay. So instead of, you know, I'll use either um, colostrum powder or whey protein powder as kind of the, the, dried, the dried powders to help cream it up. But you could completely switch that over to lacuma or tocotrienols because it really adds that kind of creaminess without having to do the dairy foods if, if you don't want to. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, so you're a new father. Your boy is four months old. Yep. And any advice on, like, you know, food choices? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Anastasia books, if that was influencing at all, like having him grow up in nature with clean air and clean water. Um, what kind of stuff could you recommend to people maybe wanting to have a kid anytime soon? Sure. Um, you know, the biggest thing for Camille and I, and right from the start, it was all about kind of conscious conception mm -hmm. and um, actively mutually wanting to have a baby together yeah. and pre preparing ourselves to create a baby, a healthy baby. So I think the first thing you know, you can really look at is the, the preconception health of mom and dad. And obviously mom is going to be carrying the baby and then hopefully breastfeeding and nourishing the baby. So you want to make sure she's nice and healthy. But also dad, you know, he's going to play a huge role. So, you know, whether that's a little bit of cleansing and, and kind of cleaning out the body a little bit, um, doing that. And for Camille, you know, I'm sure every woman's different, but for Camille... The raw dairy was a key factor in her hormonal balance in healthy pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so tons of butter. The amount of butter Camille used to eat was just insane, like one to two pounds a week sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh, topped with a quart of cream and yogurt and kefir. Um, really, it was just like dairy was the key factor. Um, getting in a little bit of red meat, a little bit of... Um, fish when she could, when she wanted to, um, but just making sure she got those healthy fats. That was the key thing that she really drove home for herself and in a good herbal protocol. 
um, mm -hmm. jelly herbs, progesterone creams. Um, there's a great supplement company called Standard Process that she got on a few actually um, bovine um, organ yeah. um, supplements that really she needed. She felt she really had to have in her body to, to create the healthy baby. And so she was on a few supplements like that. Um, deer antler extract was another one for her that was pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously staying hydrated, lots of greens, lots of salad. Um, and probably her number one medicine was probably um, this heirloom organic popcorn that we would buy from a farm kind of in the west and lots of butter on top. Nice. That pretty much got her through her pregnancy. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it wasn't all, you know, um, yeah, popcorn was like her snack food. You know, some people it's like, I need pickles, some want ice cream, whatever it is, Camille was like, give me popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. And that kept her nice and healthy. Yeah, and yeah, good popcorn. That's the most beautiful yeah. part of it. Yeah, that's great. And labor was pretty easy. I mean, was it a home birth? Yep, we we chose to um, want a home birth. Obviously, you can't make any guarantees until sure. the baby comes out. But we right from the start we planned on a home birth. We had we worked with a team of midwives based out of Portland, Maine. Really amazing um, two women who worked with us and really made it very easy for us to go through the pregnancy and, and deliver at home. Um, we had the pool set up in our living room, a little birth tub, mm -hmm. and that was where our intentions were to, to have Wilder. And actually, Camille spent her entire birthday in labor. And wow. then the, the following morning at 7, 7 in the morning, Wilder was born. And yeah, right at home, everything was, you know, pretty smooth. You know, I don't think anybody could... Um, get you ready for that experience until you actually live it yourself. You know, we got tons of advice from so many people, but until we were in it ourselves, you know, nothing at all could compare to that moment. Yeah, yeah. How was it holding him for the first time? Oh man, when I first, when actually when his head started coming out and my midwife Robin was like, Frank, you could reach down and feel the head. Um, really just started like weeping uncontrollably. Yeah. And he actually came out so fast when that moment came. And then all of a sudden, Neil laid back and we brought him to her chest and was just holding on to him. I, no, I couldn't even speak, couldn't yeah. like look at anybody. He just, just started bawling. It was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, man. <laughs> wow. It was interesting. Um, having run up, when I did this um, ultra marathon race, I ran 100 miles in under 24 hours. Wow. And I felt that was the absolute greatest accomplishment of my life, and nothing could even come close to that. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, I go ahead and, and watch this miracle of birth, and um, it just blew the running race out of the water. So yeah. Like, you yeah. know, it just trumped all of my life experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so do you have any plans for homeschooling or anything like that? I mean, it's a little ways away now, but... Yeah, Camille, Camille and her two brothers were homeschooled, and she grew up in a homeschooling community in Southern Maine, and, and we have full intentions. On, we're lucky we both work from home, so yeah. we have full intentions to continue that kind of home birthing, I mean, sorry, homeschooling yeah. um, throughout his childhood. And Camille did go to you know, public school for a few years when she got older, mainly mm -hmm. 11th and 12th grade. But so, you know, when the time comes and he make his own decision as far as schooling, you know, if he wants to try out public school, we'll, we'll let him do that. But um, from the start, we, we intend to, you know, school him from home for sure. Yeah. And do you guys intend to stay in Maine for a while? Yeah, we definitely, although... Um, based on what real true Mainers say, we can never be a true Mainer, but... Um, really feeling that Maine is the the real optimal home for us in the env in the environment. Mm -hmm. We love having the ocean here and the mountains and, and the the great farmers markets and, and farms. So Maine is definitely a place where we want to continue to live and raise wilder. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so if you want to um, give us your websites and let us know about anything else you got coming up this this fall. I mean, summer's almost over. Are you yeah. hosting any events? Longevity now. Yep. Yeah. So 
If you want to check out any of my work, my uh, spice line is found at frankspinestllc.com, and that's where you'll find all the spices in the storefront. If you want to see any of my personal work, um, potential catering and, and events like that, and all my recipes and latest videos and my blog, you can go to frankgiglio.com, and that's frank, G-I-G-L-I-O.com. And a really great event coming up, only a couple weeks until it happens, but um, my good friend Daniel Vitalis and another main botanist, Arthur Haynes, the three of us are putting on our second event together called Ancestral Ignition. And this event is a Friday evening to Saturday afternoon event um, coming up on the 16th, 17th, and 18th of September. Cool. And the whole event will, will focus on the creation of fire within your local environment. So putting aside the lighters and matches, is we're going to find plants that could be used as tinder and use as um, fire starters and kind of see how we can incorporate primitive pick cooking skills and a wide variety of different um, kind of almost survival skills and, and more do-it-yourself skills um, all around the, the base of fire. I'll be doing all the catering. 100% cool. organic, you know, as local as possible, fresh, whole food, nutrition. So, um, great food, amazing amounts of information between Daniel and Arthur. So that's coming up. And um, are people going to be camping, or would you recommend yeah, finding that? This is a pretty, the way we do this is pretty rustic. Um, we, you camp out, um, so you bring your own tent. There's hot showers available, obviously bathrooms available, and... Um, but it'll all be all be happening here at Daniel's home in in Maine. So, um, but pretty, you know, potential for rain. So you have to bring your your rain jackets and all that. But it'll be all outdoors. And oh, that sounds great. Uh, I yeah. really actually kind of want to see if I can make it up there. That's awesome. That sounds like a really good event. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. So any more information that you want, you can go to DanielVitalis.com or just Google the ancestral admission and. A website will pop up for you. But yeah. Pretty, and, pretty inspiring. And you've got a great YouTube channel as well. You're in the kitchen a lot, making a lot of good recipes. And how can people find you on YouTube? Just search for you. That, yeah, that is uh, YouTube.com backslash Chef Frankie G. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, always I try to add a, a video or two a week, and uh, lots that's of good. different yeah. varieties. And um, yeah, that's a, I enjoy doing that. Putting up the YouTube videos is always fun. Yeah, yeah. It's really, I mean, it's, I mean, it gives so much to the community and it really, I think it really gives people a lot more confidence and takes the, people are scared, you know, especially coming from the raw food world. I think your videos really are a big boost of confidence to people to get them back into the world of using fire and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's been interesting. Last, last week I just taught a, um, a class on fermentation. Cool. And I sauerkraut, kefir, yogurt, kombucha, how to do pickles, um, even did live sauces. You know, showing people how easy it was to make sauerkraut and then how to actually harvest the sauerkraut so you can see the finished product. People are like, wow, I thought it was so difficult. And, yeah. you know, all it takes is you do one batch and you kind of dial it in. And all you need is a little reference or a little inspiration or guidance. And all of a sudden it's like, so empowering it's like whoa i can make my own sauerkraut yeah so that's you know kind of what the youtube videos do for cooking i try to keep it really basic i don't do the whole kind of gourmet thing really um kind of right from the garden to the plate as as um simple and delicious as possible yeah yeah it's a great channel all right man well thanks so much brother for coming on i really appreciate it it was really nice having you thank you always appreciate what you do and to yeah. see you soon yeah, for sure, for sure. I'll, I'll definitely want to come up and uh, give my best to the family and all that good stuff and the friends, the tribe up there. Absolutely. All right, man. Take it easy. See you later. Bye-bye. See you, Frank. Peace. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Anthony Anderson at OnlyOneTV.com. And uh, check us out. This was episode eight and lots more coming up. So take care and have a great weekend. Take care. See you. Bye.
And remember, today's episode is brought to you by MountGox.com. They are the largest online exchange service for Bitcoins. They now take euros, British pounds, and Australian dollars. And Canadian dollars are coming any day now. Euros are also coming with Bitomat acquisition. The Mt. Gox mobile app on the Android market allows you to use Bitcoins on the go, on the street, anytime you need to. And the YubiKey USB security device protects your account even on compromised computers. And... BitPay, and that's bit-pay.com. BitPay is a merchant processor for Bitcoin. It allows you to accept payments in Bitcoin and receive U.S. dollars instead. It's super simple to integrate into your website, and it generates your own QR codes, invoices, and more. That's bit-pay.com. And mezzygrill.com. Authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor, and they now serve breakfast. They're on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City, which is just a couple blocks south of Columbus Circle. And they are the first brick-and-mortar restaurant to accept and sell Bitcoins in New York City. Worldwide franchising opportunities are available, and they've recently made the Clean Plates Edition for New York City. And... CarpeVM.com. Seize your market, say it with video. Charlie works very closely with you from beginning to end to ensure that your video makes an impact on the customers that you are targeting. Video on the web is ideal to engage your viewers. CarpeVM.com.